a roll. There are other ways you can measure a line in a roll. There's a thing called a PET scanner. So, PET scanner, CT scanner, hey, they're all the same, right? There's really no difference. Look. <laughs> There's nothing else to cover, right? They must be the same. No, they're not the same. Sure, I mean, the plastic cover looks the same, but once you take that off, everything's completely different, okay? It kind of reminds me of the old Monty Python line uh, where they said, it's not just the words you use, it's the order you put them in, too. <laughs> okay? So these are PET scanners. These are CT scanners. PET scanners are... Um, mm, if you have to go to get a CT scan, well, you know, it's probably not a very good thing. I mean, you probably broke your bone or something bad happened. You felt, you know, something. Or it wasn't your best day of the week, okay? But don't go to get a PET scan because then you're probably pretty ill, okay? <laughs> uh, these are mostly used for oncology applications. But the good thing is that PET scanners ha are extremely valuable because once you get a PET scan, the, the oncologist can actually do something to help you. So it's a very good thing, okay? But still, I prefer not to know that you'd have to go. Okay, anyway, so the PET scanner is here. And actually, the one reason these guys look the same is that almost every PET scanner that's sold today contains a CT scanner. They just kind of throw it in for free. <laughs> so they took the PET scanner, and this PET scanner is pretty expensive to start off with. CT scanners are like inkjet printers for medical 3D imaging. They're like the sort of they're they're the uh, the go-to guys for 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 medical imaging because they're relatively inexpensive. Okay, uh, okay, I'm not an expert on this, so any number I say is probably wrong, which is why I'll say. It. But I think the reimbursable rate for a, a CT scan, it when all said and done, costs about maybe three hundred dollars. Okay on the order of that, you know. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at your bill, it might be for 10000 But then Medicare negotiates, and they negotiate down to $300 or something like that, okay? So these are like $300. A PET scan is much more expensive uh, because uh, it's a more complex technology. Or it's not so much as a more complex technology. It's just a more expensive <coughs> technology to fabricate. Um, so they actually attach a CT scanner to it. That's one reason they look the same. And almost, and, and the physicians, radiologists like that because what they do is, see, this looks like a CT scan, and they superimpose the PET on top of it so that when this, so it used to, what don't, uh, uh, PET will just be like you'll see. Uh, first of all, the spatial resolution of PET is low, so you'll just see a blob. It doesn't have a lot of spatial definition, and the blob cars. Uh, okay, oh, I have to back up slightly. And in PET, what they do is they inject a radio tracer. So what happens is that they inject you with um, with uh, uh, a radioactive um, uh, uh, tracer. So a typical tracer would be what's called would be like FDG. Um, FDG, which is fluorine, fluorine deoxyglucose. It's basically sugar with a fluorine uh, molecule attached, but it's not a normal fluorine molecule, it's F18. So F18 is an isotope of fluorine. It's got a half-life on the order of something like half an hour, or 20 minutes or something. So if you recall what, oh no, no, it's gotta be longer than that. Uh, well, anyway, it, it's, there's a, it's long, okay, so you want a half-life that's long enough that you can use it. Because the problem is, is that um, you either need to have a, a cyclotron on premises so you can make the F18. F so in other words, you actually have to have like a nuclear physics experiment on premises, okay? Or you have to have somebody locally, like say within 50 miles or something, uh, who can produce the F18 in high concentration and then transport it to your location with a courier. Okay, so the FNT, F18 injection might cost something like, I'm making these numbers up, but they're probably not too far off, maybe $200 to get, because uh, uh, somebody has to actually deliver uh, a dose of F18 that's already had radiochemistry applied to it, so it's attached to the FDG. So, uh, so you have to make a distinction. This is a nuclear issue, right? F18 is a nuclear isotope. This is a chemical issue. Once they have the nuclear uh, isotope of F18, they combine it chemically to make FDG, which is an, uh, uh, basically similar to glucose. So your body, now 
it turns out, like, for instance, this is very interesting. Uh, uh, I don't know if everybody's ever heard of heavy water, right? There's isotopes of hydrogen. So an isotope of hydrogen has two protons, okay? So you can make water, uh, I think, uh, okay, hold on. Uh, two protons is deuterium and three is tritium or something like that? And I, do I have it right? Okay. So you can make heavy water. You can use the isotope of hydrogen, attach it to oxygen and make water. Okay, but chemically, that water is different than regular water. If you drink it, it's not too good for you, okay? <laughs> Don't go about drinking heavy water, okay? And it is heavier, right? Because you've got two protons, so, you know, you have H, uh, H2O, right? So there are two protons here, too. Basically, electrons don't weigh anything, right? So, uh, well, they do, but not much, okay? So the, this is 16, so that's 18, right? So if you have heavy water, say it would be, uh, it would be uh, 4 plus 16, so that would be 20. So it weighs more, okay? It has higher density. You don't want to drink this stuff. It wouldn't be good for you, okay? So the, the F18 isn't exactly the same chemically as fluorine, but it's close. Your body basically metabolizes this as if it's sugar. And what happens is it turns out that um, uh, uh, most cancers tend to, uh, fundamentally one of the things that causes cancer to be bad is that it grows uncontrollably. So when it grows uncontrollably, it also metabolizes a lot of sugar rapidly. Mm -hmm. So what will happen is that the tumor will basically have a much higher uptake of, uh, of glucose than the other uh, surrounding tissue. And, and it will light up. But it's, blur, it's a relatively blurry image. What will also light up are things like, see, the kidneys light up because uh, you're uh, basically metabolizing the FDG and excreting it, right? So that's a pretty typical thing. The bladder and the kidney will uh, light up. So what happens here, okay, so they superimpose this and the physician can see where the, where the uh, tumor is located. So this is very powerful technology because now what they can do is go in there, if they're doing surgery, they can uh, design the surgery to try to take out that tumor if it's hopefully uh, lo uh, localized and not metastasized, okay? Or, or they can also design oncology drugs that are, uh, they can do a biopsy so they can get molecular information on that so that they know precisely which cancer it is. There, uh, for instance, with ovarian cancer, there's many, many, many different types of ovarian cancer. So if you know exactly what kind of ovarian cancer you have, that's much more treatable. Okay. So, okay. So it's very interesting. It sort of shows the interplay between biology and medicine and, and physics and mathematics. But in any case, uh, so when the patient is injected with FDG, uh, the, the uh, FDG uh, floats around, it's metabolized. When it's metabolized, what happens is that the, F18, the FDG may break down. So, but the fluorine, the F18 doesn't change, right? Chemical changes do not change the atomic structure of the molecules. So the, fluor, the isotope of fluorine, whether it gets metabolized or not, still remains. And uh, it's radioactive, so it's unstable. The nucleus is unstable. And when it, uh, when it breaks down, it releases uh, two um, gamma rays. Oh, no, I'm sorry. When it breaks down, well, there's various things that happen. Okay, so I'm going to oversimplify this. But when it breaks down, it releases a, um, so this is the uh, F18 here. When it breaks down, it releases a positron, okay? The positron uh, annihilates with a nearby electron. So when the F18, when the F18 um, decays, when you have nuclear decay of the F18, it releases a positron. The positron floats around and very rapidly finds an electron. The electron and positron are antiparticles, so they annihilate. And when they annihilate, I'm not drawing this exactly right, okay? Uh, let, me, let me redraw this, because the physics of that was wrong, okay? So this is F18. The F18 produces a, a positron. The positron annihilates with an electron, okay? And when the, um, I'm exaggerating this. When the, when the electron and the positron annihilate, the only thing that's left is energy. So you have to have two photons. And the photons you get are two gamma particles. Uh, so this is gamma and gamma, okay? But 
uh, the momentum of the gamma particles is not exactly zero because the, pos the uh, positron had some momentum when it annihilated with the electron. So this angle here is approximately 179 degrees, okay? But it's pretty close to 180 degrees. So when you so so what ends up happening is this: when it annihilates, you get two particles that travel in opposite directions, and then you have a ring of detectors, okay? So you have a ring of detectors like this, and it's really an amazing piece of electronics when they build these things. So. Uh, so each of the detectors has a system that can counts photons. When it sees a photon, it registers the photon, and it registers the time of the photon. Now, if two detectors, you know that if there's an annihilation occurs here, how far does, does a photon travel in free space uh, in one nanosecond? Well, we covered this in the last lecture. So in one, and it's in free space, how far does something travel, does light travel in one nanosecond? Remember, it, if you remember it's the uh, uh, person who was, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, um, oh, the person who was, wrote the first compiler. I forgot oh, her name. Uh, Hopper? Yeah, Grace Hopper used to talk about this. How far does light travel in one nanosecond in free space? Oh, you said it was like a foot or something. It's about a foot, okay? <laughs> it's actually about 30 centimeters. So it travels about one foot, 12 inches, okay? So, uh, so the ring here might be like, you know, I don't know, a couple feet in diameter. There it is, right? You have to get inside of it. So it's a couple feet. So the difference in time when these two things arrive is on the order of like a couple of seconds, or a couple nanoseconds, not a couple seconds, okay? So basically, if you have two events that occur, so if Ti and minus Tj is less than, say, I don't know, let's make up a number, 10 nanoseconds. I think that's a pretty typical number that they use. Then you declare it that those must have been a coincident event that occurred from the same underlying decay of, of an F18 um, isotope. So you can count coincident events. So every time you have, a, so you count all these coincident, so if you have 512 detectors, you have 512, roughly 512 squared, well you actually have 512 times 511 divided by two uh, virtual detectors, okay? Because that's all the unique pairs you have of, of detectors. So for every unique pair of detectors, you have a virtual detector, you count how many uh, uh, annihilations occurred along that detector, and you get a line integral. So you get a line integral. So the point is, this is another technology where you can get a line integral. Once you have a line integral, mathematically, uh, it all boils down to the same inversion process. Okay. Um, but, uh, you know, the underlying physics of the acquisition are quite different. Are, are there any questions about that? Yeah. yeah. Um, presentation, how long does it have to be? Ah, that's an interesting question. Well, it's interesting. So the first thing they do is, um, or maybe you can take the camera on me. So, yeah, we don't look at the paper. Um, the first thing they do is they inject the the FDG, if the, and there are other tracers that are used too. And then usually what happens is they have the person, you know, wait maybe about an hour. And that gives time for the, the, uh, uh, the FDG to be metabolized by the tumor, okay? And guess what? During that period of time, they have them sit in a room by themselves. <laughs> you know why? Because they're radioactive, okay? <laughs> okay? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I don't know what they do about the bathroom facilities either, but that's another matter. Okay. But the nice thing is the F-18 doesn't have, if F-18 had like a 200-year life, uh, half-life, then that would be a problem, okay? Because, because then it would take a long time to dissipate. Since the half-life is relatively short, I think it's on like an order of a... Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's on the order of something like an hour or half an hour. I think it's like about a half an hour. Then after about a day, it's mostly all gone. Okay, and then and then they image them, and the 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 the, F, uh, the PET scan is pretty slow, so it can take like 
easily, uh, you know, it could be, it could be like maybe five, ten minutes, okay? And the image tends to be a little blurry because the patient can only sit so still. Uh, and you can do dynamic PET, where you actually measure the uh, response as a function of time. And there is additional information that would come from dynamic PET. But the problem is it's much more costly because you're tying up the machine for an hour rather than letting them sit in a room by themselves for an hour. And the cost of uh, medical imaging like that really is tightly, the fixed costs tend, uh, the variable costs tend to be small. The fixed costs tend to be high. So it tends to be related to how many people you can put through the scanner per day. The higher throughput means lower cost. So a good question.